Hey, strangers, welcome back to the Strange Sessions. As always, I am Kurt, and I am joined by my co-host and moral support, which is Krista. Moral support. Moral support <laughs> is because I, you know, I updated our our announcement sticky on our yeah. strange our strangers page, and on Facebook, I put a link to our iTunes on there so i happen to see some of our reviews Uh oh! and we had a couple iffy ones you know we had one where somebody was r- ripping on my comp my uh accent your wisconsin my wisconsin accent. accent okay which is understandable because i do have one well here's the thing so <laughs> <laughs> it's not like yeah. we can help it no Should but we go to, i like, also some kind of i also feel like i need to slow down my talking more and enunciate more because i feel like once i get rolling i kind of slip into the Dis and dare and <laughs> do you really i feel like i do when i I've when i edit noticed. the episode but i'm from wisconsin so yeah. why would i know so i mean that's a totally understandable one mm. but there was a girl that gave us a I mean, it wasn't a bad one she said it's a decent podcast <laughs> but it was funny that she said she just couldn't understand what was up with the girl why she was there because she never talks yeah so i'm she, just fluff so is she said is he is she just there for moral, moral support, support. Yeah. Yes. so you're my you are correct my moral support i am kurt's moral but you know support. the thing is when we started doing this you jeff and joe still had intentions of keeping paranormal palaver going mm-hmm. and you did the research for that yeah i did all the work for that. yeah so <laughs> so basically we kind of went with i would research this one and you would do that one yeah. And that's how that started. And then you guys were going to, you did record a couple episodes, your true crime one, but mm-hmm. then that kind of got sidetracked too. Yeah. Life happened for one of our hosts. Yeah. So I've just always been doing this. Mm-hmm. And I think you're I, good at it, though. I think I have more free time than you do oh, too. Probably. Because yeah. You're kind of busy. So that's one of the reasons. We'll try to get more Krista-centric episodes oh, in there. We don't need to do that. I always <laughs> joke when when I describe to people who don't know our podcast what, what it is. I say, you know, obviously it's about strange things, but Kurt does all the work and I just show up and say witty stuff every once in a while. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Well, apparently I'm not even saying witty stuff because she doesn't know why I'm here. But yeah, I just like, what's up with that's the girl? Cool. That's yeah. fine. So I, I didn't really delve too much into the other <laughs> yep. reviews because I don't like despair. reading that stuff. <laughs> exactly. You know, and the thing is like... There's, Actually, we have a lot of great reviews do. on iTunes. So we do. we can't complain. And there's a lot of... Like there's a lot of podcasts that people love that I listen to and I just can't. And I don't know whether it's it's too dry or I don't like the hosts or The what. hosts are a big deal. Yeah, they if are. If you don't like so, their style, it's like a relationship. <laughs> it is. And <laughs> you have to have chemistry with the hosts. You know, and I feel like we're kind of an acquired taste. So oh, sure, I think you so. Know, to those of you that have tasted us and liked it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Oh, that's funny. So yeah, a podcast so is like a taste test. So that's why you're my moral support. Aww. So thanks for being there. For I'm me. okay with that. Okay. You're welcome. I'm here for you, buddy. Uh, we have a couple shout outs. We actually had a lot of new people join the strangers. So where did you guys come from? Like, how did you find out about us? Yeah, we're, we're curious. Getting, we're to getting know. curious now. How people are stumbling it, across us? Right? Is it word of mouth, which I highly doubt, or are you? Is it showing up in your feed or as a recommended show, which would be really cool? Yeah. I think you have to have pretty high ratings to show up as like a recommended show, but yeah. I don't really understand how it all works. Yeah. So if you guys just join the strangers, let us know how you found us. Yeah. Because we're super curious. Totally. So our newest strangers are Athena Roth, Kimberly Sandlin, Liz Taylor, which well, isn't, isn't the... the let's you know, just pretend it is. If it is, is I she even alive anymore? American Horror Story. <laughs> Nan Gardner, who is from Wisconsin, Yay. and we got a really nice email from her. Yeah, so it was a great email. And Thank Brandy you. Terry, and we just, right now, setting up... Brandon Bennett asked to join the strangers. So thank you guys so much for joining. Welcome, strangers. Welcome. And do we have any housekeeping? <laughs> we say this every week. <laughs> I know. We always say no, and then someone comes up with something. Yeah. I can't think of anything. No. We need listener stories. Yeah. Our oh, next, yeah. Our that's next our episode is our 50th episode. And we want to do listener stories. I think we got one. No, we got a congratulations uh, call from Bridget that we'll <laughs> Didn't play. Did we get something from someone in a message and they said you can use this for the listener we story? We did. Now that you say that, okay, I good. vaguely remember that. So we have so one we'll listener look. story. So we need listener stories like badly. I'm not saying lie, but I'm not saying don't lie. You Make know what some I'm saying? shit up. <laughs> no, yes, to market explicit. <laughs> no, that one could slip, slip under the we'll radar. We'll let that slip. Um, you want to, you'll give the phone number at the yeah, end. Yeah, at the end. Do you have any other housekeeping? No, I'm good. Uh, I got something, uh, this might take like five minutes, but I'm like really, really fascinated by this. And I just got this from Dash. Okay. 
Um, he sent me this the other day, and I'm actually going to try this probably Friday. But this involves something called Randonauts. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I have Sounds I like had, some internet thing. No, and I had never heard of this. And he sent me the link, and I've been actually like just... I went down this rabbit hole the last couple of days and I'm like really fascinated by this. What it is, I'm going to start by saying this because this is a nice little, gives you a nice little idea of what it is. And this comes from the frequently asked questions. It says, no matter what choices you make and no matter how many variations on how your day may pass, there are always some places where you simply cannot be because none of the chains of your decisions will lead you there. So in order to try and break this determinism, you generate coordinates from a quantum random number generator, which as far as we know cannot be deterministic. In other words, you go somewhere that you would otherwise literally never go. Interesting. So what it is basically, and this is just in a nutshell, and this I think this started on Reddit. There's a group that started doing this, and now people are kind of going into this. And what it does is I downloaded a messaging app called, I think, Telegram. Or telegrams? I'm, I can't remember. It is Telegram. It's just a messaging app like WhatsApp or any of those. And it has a map function on there. So what I would do, what people say to do is I have an intention. I'm like, I'm going to go to this place and I want to find something that will make me smile. Or I want to find something meaningful to me. And I click a thing on that messaging app that shows where I am, my, my current location. And then I type, I think it's get attractors or attractants i think it's get attractors okay like attraction yeah and what that does is once i type that in it looks at my radius i set my radius for like a mile five uh, two miles three miles when i do that it's connected to a quantum computer that generates like purely random numbers like the like most random number generators aren't actually random this is a completely random thing so it GPS generates, coordinates it gives It generates a th- like thousands of these random numbers, and it turns them into coordinates on that radius on okay. my map. And then what it does is when it's done plotting these thousand, it looks to where like the highest concentration of random ones are. Because even in a random one, you're going to have clumps or clusters. Mm-hmm. And it finds the biggest one, and it gives you the rating of the attract, I think the attraction scale. It's just going to be some random location. What if it's in the middle of like a marsh? Then either go to it or <laughs> or do a different one. Buy but, some waiters. But people that do this, they go to this location and people say that they're, they were finding stuff that's like, like meaningful to whatever their huh. intention was. Yeah. You know, and it's weird. And hmm. people say that there was one on Reddit that I was looking at that this guy and his son did it and he asked his son to draw what he thinks would be at the location and his son like drew this stuff and one of the things on his like uh, drawing, it looked like a compass, you know, where it had like the arrow mm-hmm. and a cross link, a cross line through it. And they got to the location, and there was a piece of paper there that had this on there. What? Yeah, and one guy. That's you almost can do a creepy. chain where you go to one. It is. It is. You do a chain where you go to one, and then you generate another one and go to that one. And one of the guys on Reddit did three of them in a row, and all three of them took him to something that was painted like a rainbow. There was a rainbow mural on a wall and then somebody had the next one was somebody's house and they had a a rainbow painted truck in their driveway and the last one was like a rainbow on a rock in front of somebody's house and it took them to all those to all those randomly yeah and people that i'm assuming these people aren't trolls but these people are going out and saying that this is like really kind of crazy how they're finding this stuff when they go to this location because it's kind of from the theory about it because all the random numbers generate more in that area, there's already something quantumly, quantumly, I think is that the word, quantumly off about that area. And that area that you're going to is an area that you would have n- otherwise never gone to that day because you would have no reason to go right. there. So they said there's kind of like a weirdness hmm. about that whole situation. And then that gets into synchronicity mm-hmm. where people that do this say that they're starting to notice more synchronicities in their life and they're starting to see more Mandela effects in their life. Yeah. So they're wondering. Is this wondering, a good thing? <laughs> people, some people say no. Some people say no because they, they're saying that when you go there, you. you're actually, they call it a reality tunnel, that you're actually leaving your reality tunnel and going to this place where another parallel universe converges with it. Hmm. You know, so I'm going to look into that because I think it sounds really cool. I wouldn't do it alone, though. Well, 
You know me. Yeah, but I'll, I'm going to give it a try. So I wanted to say that on here because like our next episode, yeah, I'll say I went out and if anything cool happened or if I disappeared or... It's like a new geocaching. It is. It's like a it's like a, a strange, like a high strangeness geocaching. Yeah. And I, wa- I was watching videos of people doing it for the first time and this guy went out and did it and said, it's really weird. He said, you get like a... a good he got a really good feeling like a significant like he was doing something hmm. good I hope, if any of that I'll makes wait sense for you to try it yeah. and then maybe so, i'll try it so ever since dash sent me that i i'm like fascinated with this because i love stuff like this like synchronicity and and you know uh, one of the theories is that we are in a in a computer simulation mm-hmm. and that this is kind of breaking that simulation because you're completely going someplace where you would never have a reason to go right you weren't programmed to no. go there so what well, it'd be a cool episode if we did that yeah like and brought a recorder it with us be. i mean maybe that's something you talked and I could about do. it yeah. yeah i would totally yeah do that. so i'm gonna give it a try probably friday and see what i think but okay. reading the reddit stuff it's really interesting that some of these people you know like one of the th- one of their things was owls owls are like a sign that you're on the mm-hmm. right path and one of the ones I was reading, this guy had never done it before, and it took him to this like woods that he's never been to, and he got to you know where it pointed ground zero there, and there was nothing there, and he looked down, and there was an owl figurine laying there. Weird. Yeah. So it's like it's it's really fascinating. Huh. I'm I'm assuming that this is all legit, and this isn't like you know a hoax or something by 4chan or we'll find you know, out. something awful, but we're gonna find out. But it's just really cool, and this is something that I really love. So so when you go missing, my new cat podcast is going to be called <laughs> finding kurt finding kurt yeah. <laughs> yeah okay that would be cool <laughs> not me missing not really but you know how i am with research yeah <laughs> who's gonna do the research the more murray time i'll have some recipe mixed in with my timeline yeah so yeah that's, that's it would definitely be a papa murphy's pizza recipe <laughs> <laughs> what pepperoni and onions oh. but yeah it would be uh, the random knots thing it is sounds really fascinating really cool. so i'm gonna i would like out. to try it i hope that makes sense to people that it makes sense it's it's you know i was reading it and it's a lot of like quantum you know theory about parallel universe yeah. and all this stuff and in randomness so we'll mm-hmm. give it a try cool we'll see what happens so you have nothing Mm-mm. no no so then we will do our taste test mm-hmm. and this is our box from i think melissa the I japanese think, stuff yeah i believe it's japanese. i think nan said that she had some didn't her email say that she had something yeah, because to she send asked us? what we're allergic to oh and also uh weren't we supposed to give someone a shout out remember i brought this up in the last episode <laughs> and we were like we'll totally figure out who this is after 50 episodes we'll get better at this stuff this these are just the we need an intern yeah. we're accepting applications now <laughs> these are the, this is a non-paid internship yeah this is you know after the first 50 this is just practice these okay. are like you know the game of our third yeah, season mulligans <laughs> um mulligans what was i gonna say i just went no, pretty healthy I, yesterday I, I at work one day i'm trying to eat healthy and that's going about as good as you can imagine but I got a fruit tray from Festival, mm-hmm. like a little fruit thing. And apparently now I am also allergic to either musk melon or cantaloupe. Oh, no. Because after I ate melon in there. Isn't that the same thing? I don't know. I don't They're know. both orange, right? I think one's green. That is honeydew. Maybe it was a honey. I'm allergic to some melon because I couldn't talk and my throat was killing me. Oh, my God. After I ate that. Yeah, so. honeydew is green. Musk melon or cantaloupe is like that orange color. Okay. I wonder if it was a honeydew. I don't mm-hmm. know. Either way, don't send us melons or, <laughs> yeah. or pecans or hazelnuts or hazelnuts. The new, epi- new uh, podcast is called Killing Curd. <laughs> yeah, I got to get an EpiPen or something. <laughs> yeah, that'd be, they're really expensive, but hey, they're lifesavers. Yeah. So I will get our box of goodies from Box of Melissa. goodies. I gave Crystal. We're tasting bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. That's sweet. Ooh, that's I like don't even know big... if you call that. Oh, this is also bubble wrap. Jeez, it's in here somewhere. Oh, okay. We're down to like, this looks really interesting. Let's do that. Okay. Leave the other thing in there for now. So this is called Yan Yan. Double cream Yan Yan. It looks good. Oh, wait. Cracker stick with dip. How's that going to work? We'll figure it out. I don't know how this is going to work. This looks like it'll be good. (gasps) Oh, my God. It has like... Three so different compartments. To, yeah, we have to take... I'm going to take two of these cracker stick thingies. If I can get them out. 
take and a picture then of that. Dip one into each. Ooh, and they have like words on them. I'm gonna take a picture of that too. Wool sweaters. They have weird words on them. <laughs> Why do they have wool sweaters? Hold on. Something about eight arms. Sheep. Sheep wool sweaters. Octopus eight arms. That's what they say. So I'm gonna do a dip in the chocolate side and a dip in the strawberry side. That looks like lipstick. All right. That's a weird strawberry I'm color. Smell it. They both smell like chocolate. I'm taking frog and it says ribbit. <laughs> so I'm going to dip that in the chocolate. Maybe and these are like educational snacks. Dip it in the strawberry. Which Look. one are you tasting first? Chocolate. Chocolate? Okay, me too. Ready? Ready. Go. Mmm. Mm, that is actually mm. good. It almost tastes like Nutella. Mmm. That was really good. I like that cracker. Mm-hmm. A, sort of like... It has the consistency of like a breadstick, you know, but the flavor of like shortbread. I like the strawberry. I haven't tasted that yet. Mm. Mm. These are really good. These are really good. Okay. Hmm. Does the strawberry taste like strawberry though? It, it's really subtle. I mean, it's a really subtle strawberry. Yeah. Oh, flavor. I get it at the end. Yep. That's where I got it. Oh. No, oh, I've got mm. chocolate frosting all over my nose. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> this is actually really good. What do you think, Kurt? What are you giving it? I got all the chocolate off my nose? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. You're chocolate free. Thanks. That's why you're my moral support. <laughs> um, I'm going to give it a eight. Me too. I was going to say eight. Mm, nothing more. Y- you know it's probably artificial, <laughs> but it tastes really good. Mm. I was looking at the ingredients. Okay, let's see what, see what this one's. Oh, I got another octopus eight arms. I like those. The eight arm octopus. We're going to have a nasty one for our next episode. Yep. I took a sneak peek. We, we won't we tell you what it is, though. And, yeah, we got a sneak peek. and I'm scared. Mm. This is yummy. These are yummy. There goes my low carb for the day. <laughs> mm. Okay, wow. we're good. All right. That one was a winner. Not gross at all. Yes, thank you, no Melissa. No fish or pickle flavor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Melissa. I'm excited about that random odds thing. I think that's cool. It and sounds it's a little really scary. cool. Yeah, there's like a. It's like geocaching, but the <laughs> the cache is Something. sort of specific yeah. to you. Yeah. And whatever you find, that's interesting, but also a little creepy. <laughs> it is. So of course we're really into it. <laughs> Hmm. That you could do a whole podcast on that. Like every episode yeah. is you going out and seeing what's there and seeing what's there. I sh- I'll send you a video later. The one that I watched where the guy was talking about it and he went and did it for the first time, and it's actually kind of cool. So I'll send you that video later. That could be a Patreon extra episodes. Yeah, that actually be that's really something cool. we're gonna have to figure out if we want to do. I know. Okay, we got a uh, my printer. Oh, ink so kind of ran out on me halfway yeah. through printing out these show notes, so I'm going to have to read the first half off the computer, which is weird because I haven't done that in a while. Today's episode is, we did remember last season, I say member all the time instead of remember. Remember. Remember last season. It's because you live in Trivers. <laughs> yeah. No, I live in Manitowoc. Oh, you live I'm, in Manitowoc? Okay. I'm right down the street from Trivers. Trivers. Um... <laughs> what was I saying now? In our last season, we did the episode where Wander won... He got to pick what we yeah. did, and he did Ohio. So we thought it would be cool, and a lot of people like that. So we thought it would be cool if we did a a series, you know, where we talked about the states and talked about, you know, like for this one, we're kind of new to doing this one. So I did five like cryptid type stories from the state and five haunted slash weird areas from nice. the state. So I think that's such a cool idea. We'll hit every state. Yeah, yeah, and then we have at least forty. Eight more, more to go going. after this one? I think so. How many We've only done there? one. How many states are there? 50. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> that I do know. Okay. We didn't need, we didn't need an intern for that. <laughs> no. Um, so tonight's, this morning, whenever you're listening to it, this episode Today. is our Strange State series, and this is Missouri. We picked Missouri because that's where Dash is from, and... I was thinking on the way here, we, you know, I don't want to say 
a super fan because we generally don't call our listeners fans. No, they're friends. We call them friends, but I don't want to call them a super friend because then it reminds me of the 70s <laughs> uh, superhero cartoon with the form of form of you know Wonder Twins power activate. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So... I don't know. We got to come up with a term for... He's a super stranger? Yeah, super stranger. I okay. like it. Okay. That's just one of our super strangers. So we decided since he lives in Missouri, we would go with Missouri for this episode. I think it's Missouri. We're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a local, maybe it's Missouri. Yeah. I'm not sure. He is from Wisconsin, though. He is. Actually, from the very tiny village I grew up in, which is totally strange. Weird. Yeah. So we have five facts about Missouri. Okay. Are these strange facts or just facts? Just fun facts. Okay. Fact number one, it is tied with Tennessee as having the most states bordering it with eight states. Oh, wow. I know. That kind of okay. blows me away. Missouri is bordered by Iowa, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. Wow. Yeah, because we only have three. Mm -hmm. We have Illinois, Minnesota, and Michigan. Mm hmm but that's just crazy to me that it's bordered by eight states. That's is. a lot of states. It is. So you can go pretty much anywhere you want from Missouri. Yeah. Fun fact number two, it's a word that I can't get criticized for mispronouncing. According to the Best Things Missouri website, quote, stay in Missouri for long and you'll notice that groups of natives pronounce the name of the state differently. While Missouri is common, Missouri is also common. Furthermore, some people pronounce the first syllable meh and others ma and the middle consonant as either an S or a Z. Some older people huh. don't pronounce the last syllable at all. Linguists insist like that... Like Mizur? Miz, yeah, or Mizu. Miz, 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 I've, heard, I've heard, you know, tons of it. Linguists insist that all these pronunciations can be found as far back as the late 1600s and that each is found all over the state. While news broadcasters from the East and West Coast have attempted to standardize their pronunciation as Missouri, linguists insist that no pronunciation is any more or less correct than any other, making Missouri the only state in the Union without a single correct pronunciation. Weird. Which is cool. That is cool. Yeah. I always, it's always Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. But I've heard people say Missouri. Yeah. And it just sounds weird to me. Usually like in a movie that takes yeah. place in Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. Fun fact number three, Richland, Missouri was the only city in the U.S. that had a restaurant in a specific location, but it sadly closed in 2015. Any idea where this restaurant was? Mm -mm. It was in a cave. Wow. With more than 6,000 known caves, Missouri is also known as the cave state. Really? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I, I would have liked, I would have, I would have eaten there. I'm weird yeah. with caves. If it's a small cave. Nope. Totally no. But no. if it's like a big cave, I think that'd yeah. be cool. So yeah, but I was actually looking at, uh, I went on Facebook and it closed in 2015, which kind of sucks because yeah. I think that's a cool idea. Fun fact number four, Blue Springs, Missouri is home to the world's shortest St. Patrick's Day parade. It <laughs> extends from one side of the street to the other, and the parade route was officially measured at 66 feet. I'll be honest, that's my kind of parade. So, yeah, that is. <laughs> I don't really get into you parades. You know, the mayor, I guess the mayor and his wife walk across and... So know. it's just like a Tuesday, yeah. but they're wearing a sash or something? Yeah, pretty much. But <laughs> I thought that was cool. candy at yeah, people? 66 feet <laughs> parade that route. That is so funny. Yeah. And I mean, they're, they're kind of famous in that area for is that. Is it a big turnout to watch yeah, people yeah, walk across the street? Yeah, because it's famous that it's like the world's wow. shortest, you know, <laughs> St. Patrick's Day parade. That is funny. More time to drink green beer. Yeah, I guess. That's the way I look at it. And fun fact number five, I will not be visiting Brunswick, Missouri, since it is home to the world's largest nut, a 12-foot-long pecan, <sighs> which makes my throat close up just thinking about it. So how long has this pecan been around? But it's 12 feet long. I don't know. I don't know. Or they have it like preserved in I'm a museum they have somewhere. It preserved. I'm guessing they have it. But a, a 12, 12 foot, foot long, long pecan? pecan is... Dang. Yeah, that's a big old pecan. You can make a really huge chocolate turtle that way. <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> so those are some fun facts okay. about Missouri. That was fun. That was fun. Um, I'm trying to think if I saw anything else unusual about Missouri. I really like Missouri. I've driven through it a couple times. Uh, is that considered Midwest? Yeah. I feel like all the Midwest states feel well, like home to me. This, I, I love the St. Louis Arch. There's something mm -hmm, about the St. Louis cool. Arch I think is really cool. I've, I've never been, been. Have you been to it? I've seen it. Did you go up in it? I didn't go up in no. it, but I've been through it. I would there. have I'd like to go up in it. And I actually like researched See, how the elevator I would not works in there because I could never figure out how it works. Uh, yeah. What do yeah. they do when they get to that arch? It's, it's like on a 
you know, like a ski lift type thing where it's free to like oh, swing so it can go sense. like that. Hmm. You know. I would get all claustrophobic. Are there even windows or anything? Well, I'm sure there's windows. Ugh. Did you see the on the news recently? I remember was it in the Sears Tower or something where it was cracking? Oh, like the platform God. where they could go. Like, I wouldn't look. even do that. No, we did I that couldn't. in London. When I was in London, we were on the bridge and it, we were up above, and you're walking on gla- on nope. like clear, I can't looking do it. down. At the, I couldn't do the it. The cars below you. Yeah, my uh-uh. the older I get, the worse oh, I handle heights. Me so. too. I used to not have a care in the world as a but kid. I climbed I really trees. Want to see the St. Louis Arch? I really like. I like Missouri. I think. You know, some states, like as soon as I hear them, I have good opinions. And some states, as soon as I hear them, I have bad opinions. Okay. Missouri has always been a good, good state to me. I don't know why. I just feel like it would be really similar to Wisconsin. It is. Like I was just in Kansas and it, it's so similar to Wisconsin, yeah. except it's a little warmer there. Except they don't talk like me with accents. They have a drawl there, though. Do they? Oh, totally. It's subtle, but well, it depends on who you're talking to, but yeah. they totally have like a drawl. Huh. I didn't know that. Never you wouldn't there. expect it, but no. yeah. So now we come to Missouri cryptids slash strange creatures. And we got to start with this one because this one was my favorite. And that is number five, the Tuscumbia Space Penguins. Tuscumbia? Tuscumbia Space Space Penguins. Penguins. Say that three times. Yeah. (laughs) On February 14th, 1967, a 64-year-old farmer by the name of Claude Edwards woke up to attend to his duties on a remote parcel of land near Tuscumbia, Missouri. By all accounts, anyone who knew Edwards described him as hardworking and no-nonsense. A typical farmer type, sure. you know. Yep. Edwards laced up his boots and headed out across the cold farmland. Edwards stated that the first strange thing that he noticed was that all of his cattle in the east field were standing and looking in the same direction. Intrigued, Edwards followed their stairs through a grove of trees and was astounded to see what he later described as a massive grayish-green mushroom-like object which was sitting atop a circular tube in the meadow next to his barn. Edwards made his way to his barn to lock it, not sure what was going on. After locking the barn door, Edwards once again looked towards the object which he guessed was a craft of some kind. Then, Edwards noticed what appeared to be a group of tiny, strange creatures hastily swarming beneath the object. As Edwards made his way across his land towards the creatures, he said that they began moving in an even more agitated fashion. Edwards would later describe them as being approximately three feet in height and having a grayish-green complexion, much like their ship. He also said that it would seem that they either have no hands or that their arms were flapping or moving too swiftly for Edwards to make up the shape of the arms and the hands. Like hummingbirds? Yeah. Like, I can, <laughs> like I can see these in my head. I mean, Totally. Like, you know, I see them, like, scurrying around, flapping, yeah. flapping their flippers or whatever. Their flappers. Yeah. <laughs> Edwards also said that the creatures were either wearing goggles or had large, wide-set black eyes, and they also had a weird, dark protuberance where their nose and mouth should have been. He would later claim that these invaders resembled little green penguins with no visible neck. I'm As picturing minions. I, I picture with their like, goggles I and like Ewoks, little arms, like all scrambling around, all panicked the underneath Ewoks. the thing. Aren't like, they like, furry cr- though? Yeah, but I'm I'm picturing them like all scrambling around underneath there Weird. instead of <laughs> these penguin-like things. Hmm. Yeah. As the creatures continued to frantically jitter around the bottom of the craft, Edwards picked up some rocks with the idea of throwing rocks against the craft to disable it. That sounds like a bad idea. Once the farmer got within 15 feet of the mushroom craft, though, he was stopped by some sort of force field. Edwards claimed that he could neither see nor physically feel it, but that the pressure the invisible barrier emitted was unmistakable. According to Edwards, quote, I thought I was going right up to it. I got there and there it was. I just walked up against a wall. Looking at the craft, Edwards later said, quote, The object just looked like a big shell, grayish-green looking outfit, and underneath there were oblong holes where the lights were coming out. They were so bright you couldn't see when you got up there, as if a color wheel was turning really fast inside the thing. So, mm. <laughs> it's just strange. Yeah. Edwards, Not your typical UFO No. <laughs> Edwards stepped back from the force field and started throwing rocks at the craft. After the second stone was thrown, the creature seemed to frantically enter the stem of the craft. After a few minutes, the craft tilted towards him, began to rise up from the ground, and then shot off into the morning sky. 
Details of this account were not known until after Edward's death. A researcher who was introduced to him was one of the only people he ever told the full story to, Hmm. and Edwards only agreed to tell the researcher the story if the researcher promised not to reveal what he had said until after his death. Wow. Which is interesting because he had nothing to gain from from this. So that is the Tuscumbia Space Penguins. That adds validity to it for me. Wow, weird. I mean, that is weird. It is. There's a... You can buy t-shirts online. Of course you can. Tuscumbia Space Penguins t-shirts. And what do they look like? Is there a picture of him on it? I I believe so, but I think it was more like somebody else's rendering. Rendering, yeah. yeah. Probably adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Tuscum- you look it up in Google, and there's it shows up Tuscumbia Space Penguins. <laughs> oh, wow, and they're party animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they look like frogs to me. Yeah. It says space, 1967, penguins, live at Edwards Field. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. All right. So that is the Tuscumbia space penguins. Okay. I love them. Sweet. Love them. Creature or cryptid number four, the Nixa hellhound. And you see a There's lot of stuff. There's always a hellhound yeah, somewhere. Yeah, you see a lot of stuff about this one online. Okay. The Nixa hellhound, also known as the booger dog, <laughs> is a creature that has been spotted by several witnesses in southern Missouri. It's been described as a dog-like creature that has the face of a fox, the ears of a bat, and the tail of a monkey. Okay. That's really bizarre looking. It is. If you picture that I'm picturing it. Yep. The creature gained notoriety when somebody called Springfield, Missouri radio station KSPW claiming to have seen it wandering around the nearby town of Nixa. When more reports started coming in, the DJs, not sure what to call the creature, decided to name it Paul. The name stuck, and these days Paul the Nixa Hellhound has his own Facebook page, where his personal interests include creeping, disappearing, and golfing. (laughs) And golfing, (laughs) okay. Some people claim it was an April Fool's joke. A lot of the stories about it seem to have come from a news website called Fair City News, which, if you look underneath the name, bills itself as local satire news. Oh, sure. But a lot of people swear that they've actually seen... Is that seen, like the Onion? Yeah, kind like, of? Like, okay. the, like a small version of The Onion. Yeah. But a lot of people claim that they have seen this thing. A okay. lot of people claim that they're in the woods and they stumble across this and that mm. it's so bizarre looking that they don't know what it is. Okay. Uh, one commenter on a blog about the Nixa Hellhound claimed to have seen it, saying, quote, it looked like a deer and a dog had a one-night stand, to be honest. A deer and a, a dog. A deer and a dog. I could see the ears, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, it looked like a deer and a dog had a one-night stand, to be honest. Weird. And people don't know if maybe it's some kind of mutation. Could be. But people have seen this thing. So hmm. Paul, the Nixa Hellhound, apparently... Might exist. Funny. Paul. But you're going to see a lot of stuff about Nixa Hellhound when you look this up. Okay. I don't think I want to run into it. No. Creature cryptid number three, the butterfly people of Joplin. And well, this that one sounds great. This one was fascinating. I've actually, I remember hearing about this when this happened. Okay. So on May 22nd, 2011, a devastating EF5 tornado ripped through the town of Joplin, Missouri. When the storm was finished, 158 people had been killed, 1,150 people injured, and the town faced $3 billion worth of insurance damage claims. Wow. But even through the stories of destruction, there were stories of people being saved and seeing strange creatures. 14-year-old Lage Grigsby and 10-year-old Mason Lillard were cousins who were pulled from the wreckage of a hardware store after the tornado went through. Grigsby was believed to be dead as his body was immediately sent to the morgue, while Lillard's body appeared to have been punctured with a flying piece of metal that tore through her during the tornado. Grigsby and Lillard were both in their grandparents' truck when the tornado hit. The 200-mile-an-hour winds picked up the truck and threw it more than 300 feet across the parking lot. Grigsby was thrown from the vehicle, while Lillard had been pinned inside. Doctors soon found out that the piece of metal that had pierced Lillard had missed her vital organs by fractions of inches. If it had been off a little either way, it would have either pierced her spine or her liver. Lillard told doctors that while she was pinned in the car, she felt a hand on her shoulder. Assuming that it belonged to her cousin, she turned to look and was amazed to find herself staring at what she said were two, quote, butterfly people. She said that one had brown hair and the other had blonde hair. She later told the Joplin Globe, quote, it was kind of calming. How old are these kids? Um, b- b- 14 and 10. Oh. 
much older than I was thinking. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch told the story of a mother running for shelter while holding her young daughter. The wind knocked both of them to the ground, and the mother saw the tornado lift a car and pull it towards them. The mother cradled her daughter, trying to protect her from the brunt of the impact, but the impact never came. When she looked up, the car was gone. Her daughter then asked her, didn't you see the butterfly people? The daughter went on to tell her mother that she saw butterfly creatures carrying people through the sky. Like angels? Yeah, yep. That's what this is. But with really colorful yeah, wings? yep. <laughs> Stories started to show up from more and more people, always young people or children, and from all around the city, and they were always described as butterflies. Hmm. Stories showed up of the creatures flying over children in the storm, protecting them from the raining debris. According to a news article, the wind tossed around a car of a man and his daughter, but the little girl told her father that she wasn't afraid because she said that beautiful butterfly people were sitting in the car with them. Another news story has a four-year-old boy claiming that two butterfly people held his father's car down as a tornado tried to pick it up, while another four-year-old boy who was carried six miles away into a field told rescuers that angels had caught him and set him down safely. Wow. Yeah. So this was, I remember when this came out that there I, there were lots of reports of this. <sighs> It'd be weird. I mean, so one thing if it were just like one or two kids. But, but it was a bunch. Wow. Yeah. A young boy of about five years of age who was caught outdoors when the tornado came lumbering through, and although there was much devastation to the area in its wake, he was found to be unharmed, with the debris around him arranged precisely so that it just missed him. The boy would later claim that as the winds roared around him, he had seen three glowing figures with him until the raging tornado passed, after which they were described as smiling at him before vanishing into thin air. That's so weird. Yeah. So that's the butterfly people of Joplin. And there were a lot of stories of, you know, but stuff like that always makes me wonder, like the kids who did die, why them? Why, you know, like... Maybe there I, were only so many butterfly people. I, I don't know. You know, when I when I read stories like this, and there's lots of stories. We'll get into this, and whenever we talk about angels, I'm sure, yeah. or guardian angels, or or stuff like that. But it's always like if you're somebody who lost their young son or daughter, it's yeah. like why? Right? Why didn't they did these save things my not kid? save my kid? Mm. You know. But it was fascinating. I remember being super fascinated with this when it happened. That there were Aww. these reports of these butterfly people. I've never heard of saving it. kids. Yep. Hmm. The I remember the Joplin storm. That was a big thing when that happened because that was really bad. So now we get down to creature or cryptid number two, the Ozark Howler. The Ozark Howler is a large bear-sized cryptid that has been described as either being a giant cat-like creature or a giant dog-like creature. It's been described as having a thick body, stocky legs, black shaggy hair, large horns, and eyes that glow red in daytime and nighttime. Hmm. Don't want to run into that. No. Its cry has been described as being a combination of a wolf's howl, an elk's cry, and a hyena's laugh. And it's been described as being a dark omen that predicts the death of those who see it. That gave me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> Could you imagine hearing that? <laughs> no. Oh. I don't want to hear that. Hyena, the, the hyena, hyena laugh. Stuff, hyena laughs are creepy. Yeah. Just on their own. Because they sound like laughing. Yeah. I don't want to ever hear that out in the no. woods. No. <laughs> that know? means they found something to scavenge. You yeah. know what I mean? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Creepy. been described as a dark omen that predicts the death of those who see it. It's been said to live in the Ozark Mountains and roams between Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas. Huh. So it gets around. Yeah. The idea that the Ozark Howler is a cat-like creature supposedly originated from a sighting in the early 1980s when a truck driver who had pulled off the side of the road for the night described seeing a black cat-like creature that had a long tail, shaggy fur, a stocky build, and piercing red eyes. Hmm. Cryptozoologists have speculated that the creature may be a misidentified or unrecognized big cat, and biologists believe With that... With horns? It, hmm? With uh, horns? Apparently. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, b b b biologists believe that if the creature exists, it's a mountain lion breed who has either mutated into a new subspecies or is a hybrid of a mountain lion and an unknown creature. Other guesses have included that the Ozark Howler might be a wild boar, an eastern woodland bison, or a bison? Bison. Bison. Or an unusually large hyena. Hy hyena? Do we have hyenas? In, in Missouri. They do down, I think, do in they? Missouri. I think so. Okay. I feel like, I like the idea of a boar. Yeah. A thick body, short stocky legs, horns. I don't know where the, I guess they can be kind of hairy. Hmm. Yeah. We saw that one. 
<laughs> on the way from the podcast one day. That thing was huge. Oh, that one we almost hit? Yeah. Yeah. That thing was I don't cr- think it was a boar, but no, it, but was it was huge. It was the size it was of a, black. Yeah, it was the size of a VW bug. Yeah. It was huge. A lot of people, though, believe that the Ozark Howler is a hoax. In his 2004 book, Cryptozoology, Science and Speculation, Chad Arment states that he and several other cryptozoologists received email messages that made wild claims about Ozark Howler evidence. Prominent cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman tracked down the originator of the emails that he, Arment, and others received, tracked down to a student that had made a bet that he could fool the cryptozoological research community. Hmm. They eventually obtained a full confession from the student about how the elaborate hoax was created, including creating multiple websites in an attempt to plant the idea that the sightings went back far earlier than they actually did. However, actual Howler sightings have been reported as far back as the 1800s, and many people report having had sightings and run-ins with the strange creature. Hmm. It's been said that Daniel Boone killed a Howler while on a hunting trip in 1816, and it's said that far more people report hearing the Howler rather than seeing it. Hmm. And again, people say that they have seen this creature okay. roaming the Ozarks. So it could be this guy kind of building a hoax off of a legend that already existed. Yeah, basically. Okay. Well, well put. Thanks. You're welcome. See, I'm not just moral support. No, you're not just moral support. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. And cryptid slash creature number one, Momo. Momo? Momo. I already um, like the sound of this. Momo. Yeah, this is up your alley. And this is the big one. When you look up Missouri creatures, Momo is number one. Okay. Momo, which is short for Missouri monster, is a creature that roams Missouri and is said to be similar to Bigfoot. Ooh. I know you like Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. It's been described as being around seven feet tall, having a large pumpkin-shaped head with a furry body and hair resembling a shag carpet covering the eyes. Wow. A yeah. shag carpet. Yeah. It was first reported in 1971 near Louisiana, Missouri. There's a Louisiana, Missouri, by Joan Mills and Mary Ryan. Mills and Ryan were driving on Highway 79 north of Louisiana when they pulled off the highway for a picnic lunch. The two women were eating and started smelling a horrible odor. Hmm. I'm sure one of them asked the other one, you fired? <laughs> Did you drop one? They looked around them and standing in a nearby thicket was a half ape, half man creature staring at them. Ryan said that the face was definitely human, but it had hair over the body as if it was an ape. It looked more like a hairy human, she said. Mills stated that it started slowly walking towards the women while it made a strange gurgling sound. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I don't, no. Want, I don't want anything coming no. by me making a strange gurgling sound. Especially a hairy human. No. The women ran back to their car, obviously, sure. yep. locked the doors, and realized that they had left the keys back by their lunches. Uh, uh, this is like a movie. <laughs> it is. The monster walked around did the they car. They fall at least three times on they the way probably, to the car. They probably did. They probably did. <laughs> The monster walked around the car, stroking it, and tried to open the doors. Oh, no. Oh, my God. I would die. I would die. (laughs) (laughs) Unable to start the car and leave, they began honking the horn, which made the creature back off. But before heading back into the woods, the creature grabbed one of their peanut butter sandwiches and devoured it in one bite. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Then, one of the most well-known sightings occurred in 1972. According to an article on Singular14.com written by Emily Wayland... Which I believe is Tobias Whalen's yeah. wife. I really? Think, I think so. That's a great website. Yeah, it is a great website. I actually come across that a lot when I'm doing research for this stuff. And this is pretty much directly from the article. On Tuesday, July 11th, my birthday, 1972. Were eight you year- born in 1972? No, 1970. I was two years okay. old when this sighting right. happened, actually. Tuesday, July 11th, 1972, eight year old Terry Harrison and his brother, five year old Wally Harrison, were playing in their backyard with a family dog when their parents were at work. Their 15-year-old sister, Doris, had been left at home to watch them. Suddenly, Doris heard Terry screaming. She looked towards what he was screaming at, and the kids all saw what they said was a creature standing by a tree in their yard. The creature was described as being about 7 feet tall, completely covered in hair, and was holding a dead dog under one arm. The children's dog, Chubby, was said to have grown very ill immediately after the sighting, but recovered after a meal of bread and milk. So whatever that was scared the hell out of their dog, Chubby, too. Chubby. Chubby. Edgar Harrison, the children's father, had a strange encounter outside of their home a few days later on Friday, July 14th. Edgar was a deacon in the Pentecostal church. Pentecostal? Pentecostal? Costal. Costal. Thank you. See, you, you're... Well, I mean, that's how I would yeah. pronounce it. It doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> 
and he and around 50 other people were having a church meeting at their house. According to an account written by Fortean researcher Lauren Coleman, quote, Around 8.30 p.m., the meeting began to break up. As Harrison and a dozen or so members of his congregation lingered talking, they sighted two fireballs soaring from over the hill and descending into the trees behind an abandoned school across the street. The objects appeared at five-minute intervals. The first was white and the second green. Hmm. That's weird. Mm -hmm. About 9.15 p.m., Harrison heard ringing noises such as might be caused by the throwing of stones onto the metal water reservoir which stands at the top of the hill. The reservoir, which holds a million and a half gallons of water, is in an area where neighborhood children often play. After one especially loud ring, Harrison reported, quote, I heard something that sounded like a loud growl. It got louder and louder and kept coming closer. At that time, my family came running from the house. They began urging me to drive off. I wanted to wait and see what it was that was making this noise. My family insisted that I drive away, so I drove down Allen Street across the town branch. I stopped the car and my wife and family told the congregation, here it comes, and those 40 people turned and ran down the street. Police officers Jerry Floyd and John Whitaker went to the Harrison home. They searched the residence but found nothing. And then reports of encounters began to pile up. A man claimed he was chased by a big hairy beast with red eyes. School children said that they saw it from their classroom window. Soon, Momo was a national phenomenon. News crews and other curiosity seekers all made their way to the small town of Louisiana. Then people began finding footprints. Clyde Penrod made a plaster cast of an alleged Momo print that his daughter Christina Windmiller still has to this day. But many people believe that the Momo sightings were a hoax. And that shows up a lot in these. Yeah. You can say that about anything. Yeah. According to a 2012 article in the Southeast Missourian paper, quote, It's not human at all, Windmiller says of the footprint. It has a big heel and three big toes. But despite the footprint, Windmiller doesn't believe Momo was real. Priscilla Giltner, a retired teacher, is certain that a trio of high school boys pulled off a major hoax. By Giltner's account, the boys fashioned a homemade monster suit that they used only sporadically. They made the curious noises, planted the fake footprints, and concocted the putrid smells. I don't think they planned for it to get as big as it did, Giltner said. They were just bored. They didn't have anything else to do. I will never ever say their names, she said. That's their secret. There are people who think of Momo and they have fond memories. Let them have them. They have fond memories because of it's Momo? kind of a it's kind of a mascot. You know, it, okay. it went from being that to kind of you know like the Bigfoot stuff. Mm-hmm. Bigfoot, you know, is you believe is he's real, everywhere, but so. he's also kind of like a lovable mascot kind sure. of thing too. So yeah. that's kind of what Momo is. And she says she's convinced that these three high school students did this whole thing. Hmm. But that is the story of Momo. Okay, there's a lot of stuff down there about Momo. I, I, Some of the encounters sound real though. Yeah, like the girls in the car. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's people that are, are that say 100% it exists, that they've seen this thing, just it like there's people like that Bigfoot. see Bigfoot. Yeah. 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 And they have a lot of Bigfoot sightings down in Missouri, so, mm. you know, okay. maybe Momo could be Bigfoot, Bigfoot could be Momo, it could be related, you know. It's funny, I just said I was in Kansas, but I was also in Missouri because I flew into Kansas City, Missouri. Really? And then drove to Topeka. So you could have went out and looked for I Momo. I could have went looking for Momo. Got chased by a gurgling hairy monster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's not say we did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those are some Missouri cryptids. Okay, My I favorite, like of course, the space penguins. Mine is Momo. Yeah, I know you love Momo, but I'm all about those jittery little space penguins. I mean, they seem adorable. They do. I want to pick one up and give it a hug. <laughs> it's okay. Don't be so jittery. <laughs> Now we get to five Missouri hauntings slash weird places. I'm ready. I'm still working on how we're going to, you know, set these up, the state, the strange state series as we go. So I'm still figuring out what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I like the idea of five cryptids cryptids or monsters. Five haunted areas. Yeah. Yeah, and five like haunted locations. or haunted or weird locations. You can come up with that for probably every state, if not more. Pretty much, yep. So now we get to the hauntings slash weird places. Number five is the Smollett Cave. Smollett Cave lies near the small, unincorporated community of Smollett, Missouri. Rumor has it that at night, if you are near the cave, you can hear a quiet, rhythmic tapping sound coming from deep inside of it. During the latter days of the Civil War, passerby started hearing the rhythmic tapping sound coming from the cave during the evening hours, believing that it sounded like a hammer tapping against leather. Other witnesses added that sometimes a glimmer of light from the cave had been reflected on the waters of Spring Creek, a stream which runs east to west only a few feet north of the cave's mouth. Then, in the 1920s, 
Two women were walking up the road at dusk alongside Spring Creek near the opening to the cave when a figure stepped out from the side of the road. According to the women, the figure was a headless man who was carrying a Bible on his shoulder and a pair of shoes strung around the stump of his neck. Around this time, two boys walking along the road at night had the same sighting of this strange headless figure <laughs> with its shoes tied around the stump of its neck and carrying a Bible on its shoulder. Okay. Yeah. How it does it get around if it doesn't have a head? <laughs> it is believed that the tapping sounds that had been heard was this figure cobbling the shoes it carried around its neck, and it became the legend of the phantom cobbler of Smollett Cave. Weird. Yeah. I feel like he was probably tapping his way around, trying to find his way around the or cave. Because, you know, he didn't on, have a head. He was working on the shoes. I mean, he's... How do you do that without a head? I don't know. <laughs> but you're carrying him around on your neck. You're proud of him. He's proud of his shoes he made. <laughs> he probably can't figure out how to put them on because he can't see. <laughs> <laughs> probably. He's probably looking for somebody to help him put them on. They, That's probably what he's doing. Could be. <laughs> Shortly after this sighting, three boys went possum hunting in the cave, which I wouldn't have done, but hey. No. Suddenly, the boy's dog started whimpering and bolted out of the cave. The boys then saw a figure standing in the darkness of the cave watching them. They picked up some rocks and threw it at the figure, but the rock seemingly went right through the figure. In another instance, Walt Hayden and his cousin Porter Hayden were riding their horses home up a bridle path near Smollett Cave. In an interview in 1960, Walt said that they were riding at night when, quote, my horse stopped pricked up its ears, and stood stock still. Something like a man was standing in front of us. Then this thing began to float away like it didn't have a foot on the ground. In the years since, reports have been made of mysterious red lights seen floating in the treetops near the cave opening and witnesses claiming to be passed by a headless horseman on the road near the cave. Now he has a horse? Apparently. <laughs> he's got a horse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he's not wearing any shoes. Not around I his mean, neck. that would explain why he's hovering, because he's not wearing shoes. Well, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But that is the okay. that is the Phantom Cobbler of Smollett Cave. All right. Yeah. I like that a horse just got added at the end. I know. Well, the headless horseman. You got to have sure, a headless horseman classic. at some point. It's classic. But I mean, that's the first thing I like, thought people of when have you said gone that. to look for this cave and it's apparently kind of hard to find because it's like in a really small unincorporated part of the of the state. So people have gone to look other people know where it is and said they've been there and said that they have heard weird things. Hmm coming from caves the cave. are funny things yeah. though when it comes to acoustics and yeah. sounds oh, yeah. and yeah i mean it could have been could water, be water dripping, dripping. Yep. exactly yeah that people made into the water legend. dripping can sound like voices yeah. you know what i mean yep. so i don't know interesting but people swear cool that legend. they have seen this phantom cobbler all right but there's a lot of weird stuff around this cave supposedly people see things you know the red lights in the trees and all that yeah. stuff so that is a smollett cave maybe it's a vortex could be number four Bubblehead Road, and this is a big one down in Missouri. Bubblehead Road. Bubblehead Road. Okay. In a small, unincorporated North St. Louis County, there's a quiet, secluded street whose official name is Caraco Road, but it's more well-known by its nickname, Bubblehead Road. All along the road are no trespassing signs, and I've seen pictures that these are all over the place because people go there because so of the legends. So it's private property. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People, well, the road isn't, but the sides of the road, yeah. but people, because of this bubblehead road thing, people go there a lot. Okay. Urban legends state that at the far end of the road live the bubbleheads. By some account, the bubbleheads are either a family who had experiments done on them by the military or a family that through years of incestual inbreeding have developed hydro, hydro, hydrocephaly? Hydrocephaly. Sure. Yeah, hydrocephaly. Or water on the brain, which oh caused their heads to swell up and become oversized, hence the term bubblehead. The story says that the government gave the property that's located on Carrico Road to the family and gated them in, both to protect them and to care for them and to stop them from kidnapping and killing anyone who comes down that road. Other stories about the area reference men with hooks for hands who stalk the night, mysterious hitchhikers, ghosts with swollen heads, and mysterious lights seen in the road. Numerous reports exist about people getting chased through the woods by unseen figures near Bubblehead Road, and unsubstantiated rumors talk about hundreds of people disappearing near the road, but it being covered up by the government. According to an article on the Riverfront Times website called Five St. Louis Ghost Stories That Just Won't Die, the story might have some basis in truth. According to the article, quote, 
John Guessman, who inherited an old farmhouse on Carrico from his aunt and uncle six years ago, suggests there could be truth to this. He remembers a boy who lived at the far end of the street a long time ago. The boy had hydrocephalus, a medical condition that leads to swelling of the brain. Supposedly, he would play outside wearing a helmet to protect his fragile skull. Guessman and others say that the family moved away a long time ago, probably to seek privacy, but the legend that sprung up from that situation lives on to this day. Uh, there's tons of stuff about the Bubblehead, Bubbleheads and Bubblehead Road online. Hmm. The Facebook comments and blog comments that I read are all full of stories from people who were either chased by the Bubbleheads, know someone who was taken by the Bubbleheads, or who have partied with a Bubblehead family. So, but there's a lot of... Uh, I, I was reading just a ton of comments from people that said that they were in that woods and got chased by something and there was nothing there. But there That's was... Weird. Something obviously chasing them when there was nothing there. People report seeing ghosts. A lot of people said that they've seen ghosts in that area. Hmm. So there's just a lot of weird stuff about that. Something the, going on. Just yeah, the, the cops what? say that the cops are like really, really tight-lipped about it. Not or? tight-lipped about it, but really stay away. Monitor from that? that road oh, okay. because so many kids go out there because of the urban legends. Right. You know, they said there's constantly people getting fines and arrested and stuff out there, but. A Apparently lot of people, going missing. A lot of people say that they have seen or heard weird things or know somebody that was chased through that woods by something. Okay. Hmm. Weird. All right. That's Number, an interesting one. Yeah, that is the bubble heads. Number three is the grave of Molly Crenshaw. According to the stateofhorror.com website, according to most versions, Molly Crenshaw was a free Jamaican slave who lived in western St. Charles County during the late 19th century. A voodoo practitioner, Molly was often called upon to dispense spells and potions for local townsfolk. One year, an unusually harsh winter decimated local crops. Villagers blamed Molly and her evil witchcraft. Pitchforks raised, they descended on her modest home. Molly defiantly confronted them, placing a curse on anyone who touched her. But the mob attacked and killed her. Some say they cut her in half. Others say she was drawn and quartered, but every version of the tale ends with the townspeople burying the dismembered portions in separate graves and saying that beneath the shallow soil, the pieces are moving. Year by year, inch by inch, they draw closer together, what? crawling, wriggling, struggling to reassemble into the living corpse of Molly Crenshaw. Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> that is creepy. Lisa Mestel, a 1992 graduate of Francis Howell North High School, said virtually all of her classmates tried to find Molly's grave. That's like mm. a big thing out there is to look for, to go searching for her grave at night. Well, if it's not marked, how are you going to find it? She says they went driving through the countryside looking for old graveyards. They would go out in the woods around the high school. Then they'd curse her and say strange things like, I don't believe in you, Molly. And then sometimes bad things have happened to them afterwards, like their cars wouldn't start or they would find their tires flat. Well, I was going to say, that's just a bad idea. Legends say that two football players who went looking for the grave in the 1950s found it and tried to take the tombstone. They met with an untimely end. The sheriff's deputies is said to have found their bodies impaled on the graveyard fence. <laughs> it sounds like a totally urban yeah, legend. totally. According to a February 26, 1913 newspaper story in the St. Charles Cosmos Monitor, the real-life Molly Crenshaw committed suicide at 10.20 a.m. February 22nd of that year in the home of Harry Towers near Cottleville, or Cottleville. Crenshaw, whose first name was actually spelled Molly, M-O-L-L-I-E, had been staying at the Towers' home for a week when she was discovered in her room, unconscious and frothing at the mouth. An inquest determined that she had swallowed carbolic acid. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. No. According to the story, Crenshaw was related to several prominent St. Charles families. She was educated at the now-defunct St. Charles College and taught school until she lost her hearing. Hmm. For a time, she worked in St. Louis, but her deafness made her so despondent that she finally took her life. The newspaper listed her age as 40, but her 1910 census records listed her at age 47, which would have made her 50 when she died. The census also lists her race as white, dispelling the myth that she was a Jamaican slave. Her death record lists her as Miss Molly J. Crenshaw, a 52-year-old single white female born in St. Louis. Good God, So it's like Molly. a completely yeah. changed, <laughs> completely made up story. Huh. Because of re yeah, but people are still going out and prowling in these woods, and uh, it's something adrenaline rush, yeah, you know. Yeah, because of repeated vandalism over the years, the family has removed Crenshaw's tombstone from its place in their small, private hidden cemetery in southern St. Charles County. 
From what I understand, the tombstone was removed by the family because kids were partying there, said Doug Glenn, a 1978 graduate of Francis Howell High School. But stories to this day persist of students experiencing strange events in these cemeteries as they search for the unmarked grave. These events include cars not starting, reports of students getting tapped on the shoulder only to turn and find nobody there, and the sound of sobbing coming from empty graveyards. Well, maybe Molly's a little upset that they won't just leave her alone. Yeah, definitely. You know, or other inhabitants yeah, of the graveyard. Yeah. So there's a lot of stories about people experiencing in these small cemeteries looking for her grave. Hmm. I feel like if you go looking for stuff like that, you're going to find it. Oh, exactly. Number two, and this one's kind of a famous haunting, is the Lemp Mansion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. It's been on tons of TV mm-hmm. shows. I'm pretty sure Zach Bagans and the guys were there. And, All been possessed yeah, at one point there. <laughs> probably possessed, of course. That's what they do. The Lemp Mansion is a historical house in Benton Park, St. Louis, Missouri. The original patriarch of the Lemp family was Johann Adam Lemp, Born in 1798 in Germany, Adam Lemp started a grocery store, but by 1840, he focused solely on the manufacture and sales of beer, forming the Western Brewery. Adam Lemp's beer became very popular due to the increase of German population in the area. Lemp was one of the first in the country to produce German lager, which was a great difference from the English ale and porters. The business prospered, and when a large storage space became necessary, a cave in South St. Louis was used for this purpose as it provided natural refrigeration. The cave was below the current locations of the Lemp House and the Lemp Brewery. By the 1860s, there were 40 breweries in the St. Louis area taking advantage of the caves along the Mississippi, with the Western Brewery emerging as one of the most successful. Adam's son, William J. Lemp, took over the brewery when Adam died in 1862. In 1892, the Western Brewery became the William J. Lemp Brewing Company, with William as president, his son William Jr. as vice president, and his son Louis as superintendent. The Lemp Brewery was the first brewer to establish coast-to-coast distribution of beer with its famous brand, Falstaff. At the same time as he was building his own business empire, William Sr. also helped Frederick Pabst, Eberhard Anheuser and Adolphus Bush get started, all of which are still mm-hmm. very popular today. However, it was William Sr.'s fourth son, Frederick, born in 1873, whom he hoped to groom to take over the company. Unknown to William Sr. and his family, Frederick had significant health problems. On December 12, 1901, Frederick died of heart failure due to complications of diseases. William Sr. became despondent and slowly declined. He was dealt another blow on January 1st, 1904, when his best friend Frederick Pabst died. On the morning of February 13th, 1904, William Lemp committed suicide in his bedroom with a gunshot to the head. Wow. Yeah. William Lemp Jr. was born on August 13th, 1867. Like his father, he went to St. Louis University and then studied the art of brewing. On November 7th, 1904, after his father's suicide, William Lemp Jr. took over the brewing company as president. The Lemp Brewery suffered in the early 1920s when Prohibition started. The brewery was shut down and the Falstaff beer trademark was sold along with the brewery complex, which was sold at auction. William Jr. was also saddened by the death of his sister, Elsa Lamp, who shot herself while in bed at her house on March 20th, 1920. Wow. On December 29th, 1922, William Lemp Jr. shot himself in the head in his office, a room that today is the front left dining room. Charles Lemp, the third son of William Sr., was the final Lemp to live in the mansion, starting in 1929. Did he shoot himself? He had left the brewery in 1917 to go into banking and finance and also dabbled in politics. He never married and lived with his dog in the mansion with two servants, a married couple. On May 10, 1949, Charles Lemp shot himself in the head, leaving a suicide note that said, In case I am found dead, blame it on no one but me, Charles A. Lemp. Wow. So there's a lot of... Shooting thyself in the head. Yes. Yeah. After the death of Charles Lamp, the mansion was sold and turned into a boarding house. Along with the nearby neighborhood, the building began to deteriorate and the haunting tales began. Residents complained of ghostly knocks and phantom footsteps being heard throughout the house. As these stories spread, tenants were hard to find for the boarding house and it continued to decline to near a flop house status. Hmm. However, in 1975, the old mansion was saved when Dick Pointer and his family purchased it. <laughs> I know. It's an unfortunate name. It is. <laughs> Okay, now where was I? I knew you were going to say something about that. <laughs> immediately, be- <laughs> immediately, they began to renovate the building, turning it into a restaurant and inn. 
Workers within the house often told stories of apparitions, strange sounds, vanishing tools, and a feeling of being watched. Frightened by the hauntings, many would leave the job site never to return. In a downstairs women's bathroom, which was once William Jr.'s personal domain and held the first freestanding shower in St. Louis, many women have reported a man peeking over the stall at them. This ghost is said to be that of the womanizing William Jr. All right. And that's actually a lot of people have reported being in that bathroom and then looking up and seeing someone looking down the top of the stall at them. Pervert even in death. Yeah, pretty much. In William Lemp Sr.'s room, guests have often reported hearing the sound of someone running up the stairs and then kicking at the door. When William Sr. killed himself, William Jr. was said to have run up the stairs to his father's room and finding it locked, began to kick the door to get into his father. And that's a common one, too, is a lot of people say that, that stay in that room say they hear that. They hear someone come running up the steps, kicking the door, and then they open it, and then there's nothing there. God. There are several... I probably wouldn't stay there either. <laughs> There are several reports of visitors seeking a spirit known as the monkey-faced boy. It is rumored that William Lemp Jr. sired a bastard son named Zeke who was born with Down syndrome and that Zeke was kept locked in the attic. Zeke is believed to be this spirit that is sometimes seen and can be heard in the attic of the mansion. According to St. Louis historian Joe Gibbons, when he interviewed a former natty and when he interviewed a former nanny and a chauffeur that worked at the mansion long ago, both of them verified that the boy did exist and was housed in the attic quarters that also housed the servants' rooms. Smells of cigar smoke, sounds of horses outside when there aren't any horses, apparitions appearing and then quickly vanishing, voices and sounds coming out of nowhere happen all the time, and glasses will often lift off the bar, flying through the air by themselves. On other occasions, doors are said to lock and unlock by themselves, lights inexplicably turn on and off of their own free will, and the piano often plays in the bar when no one is near. So this place is... Happen with activity. Happen with activity. Jeez. And this is this is on like a list of the 10 most haunted places in America. The Lemp Mansion, Lemp Brewery always shows up hmm. on that list. That this place is okay. like insanely active. And that is the Lemp Mansion. Number one is Zombie Road. Zombie Road, also known as Lawler Fort Road, is often called one of the most haunted roads in America. The history of this area goes back to Native American times when this was one of the few pathways created by nature over the centuries through the bluffs to the Merrimack River. It is believed that Native Americans used this pathway to both travel and to collect flint. The area is also near the site of one of the largest Native American burial mounds in the country. The road is believed to have been constructed as a gravel road at some point in the late 1860s and was eventually paved. It was originally built to provide access to the Merrimack River and both the railroad tracks located along the river and the ferry boat that once carried people across the river and back. Even from the start, people said that there was something off about the road. Truck drivers who would use the road to haul stone often felt that there was an unnatural silence and darkness to the road and would often report that they felt like they were being watched. According to an article on the website Ghost Theory, quote, Strangely, even those that I talked to with no interest in ghosts or the unusual at all mentioned that Zombie Road was a spooky place. I was told that one of the strangest things about it was that it never looked or it seemed the same length twice, even on the return trip from the dead-end point where the Stone Company's property started. At times, one person told me we had the claustrophobic feeling that it would never end and that we would drive on forever into deeper darkness and silence. It's creepy. That's really creepy. Yeah. In the 1950s, the secluded road, which was rarely used anymore, became a lover's lane and party spot for teenagers. Legends started to appear of a man that has said to have escaped from a nearby insane asylum and was said to live in a shack by the river. This man, nicknamed Zombie, was said to prowl the woods surrounding the road, scaring off, stalking, and attacking young lovers. Soon, the road gained the nickname Zombie Road, which has stuck to this day. Hmm. In 1876, Della Hamilton McCullough, wife of a local miller or judge, I got different opinion. I got different so things. Two wildly different professions. Yeah, two wildly okay. different professions. <laughs> Della Hamilton McCullough, wife of a local miller or judge named Henry McCullough, was killed after being run over by a railroad car along the road, and it's believed that her spirit roams the area and is one of the most frequently sighted ghosts along the road. According to the Ghost Theory article, quote, only a few remnants of the original railroad can be found today. The old lines can still be seen at the end of Zombie Road, and it is along these tracks where the railroad ghost is believed to walk. 
There have been numerous accounts over the years of a translucent figure in white that walks up and down the abandoned line and then disappears. Hmm. Those who claim to have seen it say that the phantom glows with bluish white light, but it always disappears if anyone tries to approach it. This is believed to be the spirit of Della McCullough. Hmm. And that's, you know, so many places have the train, you know, the ghost along the train lines and whatever. There's a haunted road. We have a couple of those here in Wisconsin. During the Civil War, the road was used as a spy route for both Confederate and Union soldiers, and it's said that many men were killed along the road. Several abandoned homes and shacks line sections of the road, and stories persist of people experiencing things at these abandoned buildings. People walking along the road have reported hearing the sound of a woman screaming at them and then seeing an old woman glaring at them from out of one of the windows of one of the shacks. When people go to the abandoned building, no one is there. I came across a ton of comments on blogs and articles from people who say that they've been there and have heard someone scream at them from these shacks and there's there's nobody nobody there. there. No. Hmm. There's a huge laundry list of ghost sightings along Zombie Road. The ghost of a young boy has been seen roaming the woods, and it's believed that this is the spirit of a boy who died after falling from the bluffs overlooking the woods and whose body has never been found. People have reported seeing the spirits of Native Americans, of Civil War soldiers, of what appear to be quarry workers missing limbs, a ghostly group of young children that has been seen giggling and running through the woods at night and is believed to have lived at a nearby orphanage, Tons of stories about seeing shadow people moving through the woods. The ghosts of railroad workers have been seen roaming the woods, strangely accompanied by what sounds like distant old-time music. And the ghost of a faceless man, which stems from the story that during the 1960s, a couple in their late teens were on top of the bluffs overlooking the road below. When the man lost his footing and fell from the bluff, catching his face on the limb of a small tree growing out the side of the bluff, which tore his face and scalp off, while the rest of him fell to his death. Oh, that, um, that is added to my list of so ways that I do not want to die. I will continue to be horrified by that for the next <laughs> several hours. That is the faceless. Oh my God. Yeah, that is the faceless ghost that is said to be seen. Oh, well, now you're all like freaked out. No, I don't know if it was a shadow of a bird or something. Oh. Or... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so yeah. That is on my list. I do not. No, I <laughs> prefer not to die is, that way. Falling is dying. Oh. Falling and dying is bad enough. Getting your face and scalp torn off <sighs> by a limb is yeah. not cool. No. That gave me the heebie-jeebies. Yep. From the Ghost Theory website, quote, Many of the people that I have talked with about the strange happenings here speak of unsettling feelings and the sensations of being watched. While we could certainly dismiss this as nothing more than a case of the creeps, it becomes harder to dismiss when combined with the eerie sounds, inexplicable noises, and even the disembodied footprints that no one seems to be able to trace to their source. Hmm. Many have spoken of being followed as they walk along the trail as though someone is keeping pace with them just in the edge of the woods. Strangely, though, no one has ever seen. In addition, it is not uncommon for visitors to also report the shapes and shadow of presences in the woods, too. On many occasions, these shapes have been mistaken for actual people until the hiker goes to confront them and finds that no one is there. Hmm. Now paved and partially remade into a modern-day bike trail and jogging path, the notoriously popular two-mile stretch is now known simply as Rock Hollow Trail. It's closed after dark, and the police are very strict about that, but sightings and strange experiences along the trail continue to this day. Hmm. So those are the hauntings... Slash weirdness from okay. Missouri. Missouri. That is for you, Dash. Get out to some of these places. Definitely check out this uh, zombie road because that sounds like that's something you would enjoy. I would actually really like to see that road. But there's a lot of people that say that that's a very, very strange road. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. So that is Missouri strangeness. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I always like hearing stuff like that. Krista is looking intently at her phone. I know. Because we're going to do some housekeeping again. Okay, some late housekeeping. Do yeah. it. I just wanted to mention uh, just some messages that we've gotten lately, but I'll start with one from Brian Martinez. He follows us on Instagram. Hey, Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, it's funny because we were talking, this is about the the two girls, Lisa, what were their names? Lisa. Oh, you're talking about the... Uh, Froome. You're, you're talking about Lizanne Froome and Chris go. Kramers? Chris Kramers, yes. Yeah. So his first comment was something like, 
the tour guide did it and then like shudders. Yeah. <laughs> Which that after you hear about the tour guide, you're it's, like, yeah, eh. it's a little sketchy. Yeah. If so anybody the, did kill them, my money's on the tour guide. It probably is that guy. Yep. Yeah. So he says, I got to say, this episode really stuck with me so much so that I went on a rabbit hole of theories and investigations, listened to every podcast devoted to this case and read most of the Reddit stuff on it. I really don't think it was a clear cut accident. I think something spooked them further into the trail and one of the girls got injured during the frantic commotion and that's what led to their unfortunate demise. Whatever the case, it is such a heartbreaking story and I think it's human nature to seek closure for the two young women. I think that's that's totally tr- could be true. Something, yeah. it could be a combination. It wasn't yeah. just that, you know, they had a series of unfortunate events. Something could have scared them well, off the trail. Some people theorize that the tour guide is the one that came to find them and they saw him coming for them up the trail and they took off and ran to the woods to get away from him and that's, and that's how they got lost and died. And injured and yeah. all hell yeah. broke out after that. Yep. So thanks for your input, Brian. Yes, thank you. There. I think we had quite a few people mention stuff on Facebook. Yeah, somebody too. else mentioned too about the fact that you don't need to have the PIN number entered in order to call 911. 911. Right. And I mean, that the fact that I'm assuming that the girls knew that. I'm assuming that. I mean, it's right on your phone. Yeah. It I'm, says so right on that there. kind of adds to the fact that maybe somebody had their phone and wanted, like, somebody was trying to get onto her phone to see if they had, if there was any evidence on her phone of him you know what i'm saying like if somebody Mm -hmm. killed them he had the phone and wanted to see if there was a picture of him and he wasn't able to get onto the phone but then that leads to the question why not just destroy the phone or bury the phone right nobody would ever find it right a lot of that doesn't add up no another funny not funny thing but interesting thing to mention though is my husband will keep his phone in his back pocket it's a smartphone you have to use a code to unlock it and he has accidentally dialed 911 Oh boy. A few times. <laughs> because it must just, you know, hit the yeah. phone just right yeah. where it swipes it to make yep. an emergency call. Yep. And so, I mean, that could have happened too. I never keep my phone in my back pocket. No, me neither. A, it's, it's one of the reasons I wear all these like shirts with the pockets on the them pockets. because that's where my phone gets tucked. Yeah. My phone and my gum and my Fitbit and whatnot. Your gun. My gum. <laughs> <laughs> As in extra. As in <laughs> Wrigley's Dentine Sub Zero. Right. Serious cold. Sub zero. All right. So we got an email from Michael Wofford um, to our Gmail. It's just short and sweet. New listener and love your show. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, we got another. This is a message on Instagram from Codename Duchess. That's the na- their their handle on Instagram. It says, "Hi guys, I'm currently listening to the latest episode about the two women who died hiking." Oh, this is the one who says, yeah, in regards to you questioning the 911 call, this is the person who points out that um, it does not have to be unlocked. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's. If she was dead, that would explain how the call was attempted later. You wouldn't need to know the code. So. That just bugs me. Maybe maybe true. she was trying to turn it on to get the flashlight on there on. I don't know. I don't know. The, 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 the pin mean, number thing has always bothered me. Like why? Yeah. You know, why? We'll never have these answers either. That's the kind of bummer part about it but we got so. a really really sweet email email we got, a, we got a really really <laughs> sweet email from our listener nan she says i'll read these because we got two really nice ones from her okay hey fellow cheesehead here yay for wisconsin Woo-hoo. has spent the last three days catching up on the pod and i'm having so much fun i started with the recent episodes but have jumped back to the beginning now i like to listen at night but i usually fall asleep then re-listen the next day <laughs> That's a lot of people the second fall person. To us. <laughs> anyway just listen to season one episode three on your experiences and wanted to ask if you have considered doing an episode on summer wind yeah i was st- I was thinking it'd be amazing to get in there and find out if there's anything there. Also, Taliesin? What is Taliesin? T-A-L-I-E-S-I-N. There's got to be something in Wisconsin. I've seen that. Mm. I've seen it, but I don't know what it is. I'm going to have to look into that. She Back says, to Summer Wind really quick. I don't think there's actually a building standing no, anymore. No, there's not. It's but basically at some a point, foundation. At some point, we're going to do a Strange States episode about Wisconsin. That will definitely and that's be, be on one there. of them. She says, I love your give and take, your healthy skepticism, the stories you choose. Your topics are well done and make me want to go with you on your next investigation. Keep it up, please. And she says, the tasting part of the show is so much fun. I feel like there's nothing you won't try when it comes to food or drink. And I give Krista a lot of credit. Krista's tried some stuff that I I did not think that she was going to (laughs) try. She says, I do have one snack food item to send you. 
and I, but I want to find a beverage to send as well. Nice. And she says, finally, you are from Wisconsin. You do us proud. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then we got another email from Nan saying, I started listening last fall and I got sidetracked with all the new podcasts coming back. I came, quote, back to my roots for a lot of reasons. With the exception of a couple, I got tired of true crime podcasts and the chatter between the hosts got very irritating. You and Krista have just the right balance. Aww. One more question and I will leave you alone. Are either of you allergic to any foods? <laughs> That's me, obviously. <laughs> Thanks and keep up the good work from Nan. It's I am so- allergic to pecans, Brazil nuts, hazelnuts. And apparently some and kind apparently of melon. And apparently some kind of melon. <laughs> the so- melon, I, w- I was fine. My throat hurt and I couldn't talk, but I wasn't like afraid that I was going to die. Like I kind of how much of it did you eat? A pretty good chunk because I was Mm. eating chunks of melon. So I think it's just like a minor. Maybe don't eat it anymore though. I'm not planning on it, but you never know. Somebody mentioned Spooked. Yeah, the podcast. Yeah, I listen to it. I'm a huge fan. I heard that it's coming back, or it's actually going to be year round now, and not just during like the fall. So I'm really pumped. Yeah, I know somebody mentioned that on the Strangers too. See, and like the only one I listen to Bridget's. Because mm-hmm. we love you, Bridget. Me too. Yep. And uh, uh, check it out. It's my best vintage life. Yeah. Yep. The only other one I really listen to is blurry Sofa photos? King, the oh, Sofa, Sofa King Kings. podcast. Not even blurry photos anymore. No. Yeah. No. Not ever since the other guy left. When it was the two hosts, I really like blurry photos. But now it's just not the same. I mean, I listen to mostly the Sofa King podcast. And I remember back in the day when somebody gave us a bad review because they said we joked too much during the episode. <laughs> I hope to God they never listen to the Sofa King right, podcast no because kidding. they are... There are a lot of podcasts like that, They are though. hilarious, but they are super, super not politically correct oh, and sure. very dirty. Okay. Um, there was another comment. I just wanted to read a couple more things. Jessica Holland commented it was on the photo of your coffee cup down the long dark hall when oh we recorded yeah the last McDonald's time. one yeah and she said just listen to the last three episodes in a row this morning can't wait for more oh, so thank, thank you. you and another it says ghost in the bourbonites that's the, these are all instagram said this is after we tried the jalapeno and M- m&ms Blech. and they said the other limited edition flavors are pretty bad so yeah. heads up on the that jalapeno ones was horrible I know Dash was looking for those. He well, he went out and looked for those. And yeah, he said them. he couldn't find them. I've had the Nutella ones that he, they just taste like M&M's See, to Nutella me. has hazelnuts, hazelnuts, and that's what scares me is that I don't know yeah, if I'm don't allergic try that. to that or not. Oh, I love Nutella. It just it's sucks. Like I used so to good. be able to eat whatever I wanted, and now all this stuff's going to kill me. Well, let's, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to say, th- she's on episode three. That, thank you for sticking it oh, out God, with I know. the bad I was going to say that too. I was going to say somebody, sound quality was somebody terrible. else messaged me that said they had just started and they were like seven episodes in and I just want to message them and be like, it gets better. I Tell mean, them that. Do yeah, it. Yeah. it. Like, thank you for sticking in with seven because our sound quality was really iffy at the yeah. beginning. We were really We're still learning as we go. We yeah. Still and we fixing. still have glitches. Yeah, we do. I think that's just the laptop. Yep. I mean, the equipment works so pretty So thank good. you so much for the messages, you guys. Yeah, we really love yeah, hearing we, feedback. We, and We love you guys. I did also want to mention, too, that um, so the Missing 411 episodes that we've done are our most popular episodes for sure. Yeah. A cu- I think the there are two top episodes that have had over 1,600 listens each, and that's People, because we have such long episodes, I think that's people starting the episode and, and finishing it, yeah. it later. Some people do listen twice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but we are, the last time I looked, the Missing 411 Revisited episode had 990 unique listeners. So we are 10 people away from wow. 1,000 listeners, nice. like unique listeners. Nice. And the first Missing 411 episode had like 960 or something the, like the that. The first one was so bad sound-wise. You know, the missing four one one. Yeah, our first was missing, it. That was back when we had lousy uh, sound quality. Okay, well we've gotten better. We have. We'll we'll hopefully continue to improve. Yep. Time for one listener question. Yeah. Let's do it. Today's is sent in by anonymous. Okay. And it's a music question. <sighs> People love these Which music questions. Is appropriate because today is the opening day of Summerfest. If you know anything about Summerfest, it's the largest music festival yeah, there's, there's in the ba- world. So many bands are I want to see, but I don't want to go because it's, it's too hot. The parking it's too is crowded. insane. It's gotten uh, more expensive, but it's like two weeks of live music all day long. Every I know day. Third Eye Blind is there, and I love Third oh, Eye Blind. Do? But yeah. I just and tomorrow I'm going to the Milwaukee Brewer game, so we're going down that way tomorrow. 
I've seen a lot of great bands. Oh, I, back in the day, I saw a lot of bands, yeah. a lot of comedians. You know, Dana Carvey, all those, you know, like the old timer ones. But nice. I just don't have the patience to no, go there anymore. No, I don't either. The crowds. When I lived stinks. in the Milwaukee area, it was so much easier. But the question is, hi guys, love the show. Thank you. The question is, if you, if somebody looked through your CD collection or your music collection, what is in there that they would be like, what? Hmm. I'm assuming that's like what would really obscure, not a, obscure or like that doesn't they would not seem think to match. That with doesn't you? seem to match with you. I'm guessing what that that's what that means. Thank you so much. That's it. Hmm. CD collection, huh? Yeah. People listen to CDs. <laughs> I still have like a huge case of CDs. I still have CDs that, that has like stickers all over yeah, it. It's yeah. full of like fish and the Grateful Dead and Beastie That's weird Boys. That younger people don't 311. Um, know what it was like to have CDs. What would be the thing they'd find in there and either think, what the hell, really? People probably don't look at me and think hip hop. No. I mean, I have a ton of outcast It CDs. surprised me when I found out how much you were into the Beastie Boys. Yeah. Because you don't strike me as a Beastie no. Boys I have, like, almost all of their CDs. I stopped buying CDs, like, I don't know. I, I think To the Five Burrows was the last one I bought. And then MCA died, and I've been very sad ever since. Yeah, I don't know. Probably hip-hop, because I don't look like somebody <laughs> who's probably really into Outkast or, or like, Dr. Octagon. I, I mean, this is like is. some really obscure, yeah, like the Goody Mob and the Far Side and Tribe Called Quest. I mean, these are like old school hip hop. I've seen Run DMC in concert with the Beastie Boys. Like That had to be good. It was amazing. Yeah. I don't know. That's probably I, it for me because you don't look at me and think, oh yeah, hip hop. <laughs> I don't know because I don't know what you people... You listen to a lot of obscure stuff I've never heard of. I listen to a lot I've of different of. kinds of things. I yeah. really do. Uh Two that I can think of off of the top of my head are two. I know that, like, uh, I know a couple people that listen to the podcast have heard of them, but two, like, weird ones that don't fit in with what I usually like, I guess. There's a Canadian, I think if they're up there, they're called collectives, where it's a bunch like 20 different people, mm -hmm. you know, instead of a band, it's a collective of a bunch of people. There's, there's one that if I had to pick, a band that was my band like throughout my life it would be this band and that is one that people have probably never heard of and they are called brand van 3000 i knew you were gonna say that because because you gave me one of yeah. their yeah and they're like impossible to explain yeah. because they're like some of their stuff is like it's electronic it's electronic some yeah. of their stuff is hip-hop some of their stuff is like almost country it's kind of trancey some of their stuff is trancey they yeah. just have a lot of different music and uh, when I was young, I found their CD called Glee. Wow, they've been around that long. They've been around for a long mm -hmm. time. I found their CD Glee in like a used CD bin, and I decided just on a whim to, check, to it check it out. And that's I still listen to them all the time in my car, and that's kind of my band. That's Brand Van 3000. The only song they've ever had that was kind of famous or popular was a song called Drinking in L.A., hmm. So that's that's my. It was cool. I I thought the the music. You yeah, gave me it's was great, cool. but it's like people don't know them. And it's uh, good driving in a car. Music. It is good driving, but it's just such a different mix of music that you would not it expect. Is. But the other one that I would say is a Japanese band called Genki Rockets. <laughs> which I don't know why that made me. If laugh, somebody but... would have told me years ago that one of my favorite albums would be from a J-pop band, right? It's. I believe it's one or two gels. Okay. And it was originally started to do one song for a video game, a song called Heavenly Star that was for the video game Luminous okay. 2 for the Vita. And I remember hearing that song somewhere and really liking it. And I, I ended up managing to get their CD from somewhere. And it's just like, like J-pop. It's bouncy. Hmm. They sing in English. They sing in English. Okay. But it has this weird theme going through where the girl that's singing is like, was born in outer space and she's like an outer space kind of thing, but she loves somebody that's on earth. Hmm. And it's really weird. Okay. And a couple years ago, I found out that they had a second CD. So I managed to get my hands on that. And that is literally one of my favorite CDs. Huh. 
And I never heard if, of it. If you see me driving my car and singing along to something, chances are it's this really young girl J pop. But and that's like I've like come across other J pop stuff, and I'm like no. But there's for some reason this is just bouncy and happy and. I really like it. Hmm. And they sing in English. Maybe I'll post a yeah. video from them in The Strangers. That's but cool. that's that's probably what I would pick. But I just have weird, you know, like I love... Your tastes run the gamut. My sure. tastes do run the gamut. You know, there's... there's Except for like like rap and hip hop and... You like the Beastie Boys though. Yeah. Yeah, I do. But other than that, I listen to pretty much anything. Hmm. Country surprised me. I love country music. Country music is way better than people give it credit for. I, I'm telling you, uh, old, Certain Domin- people I can't old Dominion, Florida, Georgia line. So good. Making faces over here. <sighs> what am I going to do with you? I can't get too twangy or my But it's hor- not twangy. Like old, Dominion. old Dominion is more poppy than I even think country. Hmm. I think they're just a really good band. And yeah. I love Lady Antebellum. I do too. You know? I like them. So Certain see, and groups that's, I like. That's so see, you're not you can't turn your nose up at country because you do like some country. Stuff. I do like some country. I yeah. would rather listen to Patsy Cline though. See, and that's the country I don't like. Hank the old Williams whiny, Senior. The old whiny twangy. Bocephus. No, nope. Hmm. We're gonna agree to disagree on that. I know that's fine. That's <laughs> so, cool. I still love you. Th- I still love you too. <laughs> so thank you for the question, yeah. and I think that's it I for tonight. That is deets. Oh, deets. I always forget the deets. I know. You guys, send us some stories. Yeah, some we are in stories. desperate need of stories. Send us listener here. stories. Email them. Call us. Uh, even if you send us congratulations on 50 episodes, guys, talk about how you found the podcast. Tell us what your favorite episodes are. Yeah. We're going to read those on air. In and the suggestions next, for upcoming topics. And suggestions. Topics. Whatever you guys we'll send us. put it all us, on the episode. Whatever you guys send us between now and the next episode, we are going to read in the next episode. Yep. So send us some stuff. Our deets are pretty, pretty, please. (laughs) Our deets are you can email us at thestrangesessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at strange session without the S. Krista does a great job on Instagram at the strange sessions and. You always tag me and stuff. And then uh-huh. we do have a lot of people that follow us on we Instagram. We do. We've got which like almost awesome. 330 people. So. If you want to send us postcards, snail mail, or snacks, prepackage, please. No nuts. No well, nuts. Only certain nuts. No nuts, no melons. Yeah. <laughs> we are. If someone sent us a melon, come a on. Melon covered in pecans. <laughs> right. Somebody wants me dead. We are at The Strange <laughs> Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. 54221-0434. And you can call our Strange Sessions hotline and leave a three-minute message at 920-443-9602. We need more postcards. It does, I want yeah, more we postcards. do need some more postcards. It doesn't ring on my phone, but when somebody calls the hotline and leaves a message, it pops up on my phone. So I'm always super excited to see yeah. when somebody called the hotline. So give us a call, but we need your stories. Yeah. We just want messages from you guys that we are going to read on the air next time. And if nobody sends us anything, we're going to have to figure something to do. So here's an idea. I think that anyone who has sent us a postcard behind me, whatever state it's from, those are the states we should yeah, start with. Yeah, that is with. a good idea. So if you send us a postcard from your state, we will do that yes. as one of our upcoming yes. episodes. And remember, if we read something of yours on the air Next episode, you are going to be entered into a contest where the random name we pick gets $50 gift card or just $50, even though Krista doesn't want me to mail it out, Uh, a signed copy of one of our show notes and some stickers. Some stickers. And Krista just reached up and grabbed the pickle book. So we will end today with a pickle joke. All right. I can figure out where we left off. This is a math one, so I might not get it. If 10 pickles are a bunch and 20 pickles are a barrel, how much are 30 and 40? 70? Yep, that's the answer. Wow. I'm kind of impressed I got that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do another one. What's every pickle's favorite game show? What? Let's make a dill. <laughs> <laughs> that one wasn't okay. too bad. That, I one was like actually, that, one. that one was actually oh. funny. That's a good one to go out on. Yeah. So episode 49 is in the books. Dang. Next one, episode 5-0. The big 5-0. And that's amazing to me. Yeah, me too. So thank you guys for sticking with us. For sure. And until that episode, until next time, from Krista and I, stay stay strange. strange.
This has been an Old School Media production, executive produced by Kirk Konechny. For more information and content, please visit strangesessions.com.